I think the recurring theme through everyone's talk is that you know, there are many pathologies that can be done through a one or other approach, whether it's two different cranial approaches or in the nasal versus cranial. And in your conclusion slides, everyone has mentioned this whole uh, concept of being comfortable. I'm sure there's lots of, uh, you know, doing what you're comfortable with. There's lots of resonance uh, listening to these talks. And I just wanted to know your guidance in terms of, uh, should you just pick one and get really familiar with it? Or, you know, in your formative years, is it something that uh, you, you really need to have a grasp of that both approaches in your armamentarium? And how does one do that? If you're not at Pittsburgh, uh, I mean, how does one get a lot of endonasal experience? Dan, why don't you start first? Because, you know, you've really mastered both. Uh, you know, I'm not quite sure if we're all at the stage of Paul in terms of endonasal, but you and I have been doing endonasal for a little while now, and we've certainly been doing, neuro, you know, I think we're the oldest ones here, aren't we? Yeah, yeah, you and I are the old, oldest ones here. So for the young people, uh, how, how do they get the sort of experience that Paul gets at UPMC? Well, I think that... Um you know, most of the programs have switched over to endo endoscopic endonasal approach, but not all of them. I mean, it's still surprising when we're interviewing fellows, how many, and Paul, I'm sure you have the same experience, how many of them are still doing, um, you know, microscopic or endoscope assisted. And um, I think that residents should try to gravitate toward um, high volume centers. I think, um, you know, when people that are putting out publications and trying to refine their technique, I think that's important. Um, you know, and I, the other thing that I would say, just transitioning from the endonasal to these other keyhole approaches, I encourage people to use the endoscope on every single brain tumor case they do, or, or even an aneurysm case, just to use the endoscope, go in, take a look and get used to, to the difference in view, because I think that's one of the things you learn. And, and it's, you know, as we've all said, it's very different maneuvering the endoscope in the head than in the nose. It's a, there's a lot more um, risk involved and your, your assistant needs to be very facile and agile in providing a view and, and being, being careful with where the endoscope is. I mean, we, we typically will, we do use the holder, um, the pneumatic holder for some of the posterior fossa cases, but for the most part, certainly for the eyebrows, we're, we're, we use a human holder. And I, I, and that way you can, you know, occasionally we'll just go in and look with one hand and, and the instrument and the other, but usually if you're going to do anything, any sort of dissecting, it should be with two hands and someone driving the endoscope. And um, I, I think that's just a matter of, you know, encouraging att attendings and, and residents to put the endoscope in the head and, and start doing it. Cause you'll, you'll be amazed at what you see if you don't do it very often. I yep. think it's very important to use the endoscope as often, <clears throat> um, even in cases where you're not necessarily need it, uh, instead of using it only if you definitely need it, because then if you're not used to it, it makes it much more difficult. But I think one of the key steps to get more experience in transnasal endoscopic surgery is to really work closely with the ENT people together. And so for the younger, it's also maybe interesting to, to participate in non-neurosurgical cases, just mm -hmm. um, uh, um, paranasal sinuses cases with the ENT to get used to the type of surgery, to the um, view of the endoscope. And these cases, of course, are much more frequent than um, skull-based skull cases that we do transnasally. I personally um, did start transnasal surgery without an ENT because the ENT people were in a different area for that time when I started and it was just much too time consuming to waiting for them. But now over the last 10 years working in, um, together with Robert Reich and, and the people, the ENT and Daniel Simon and hans Rudi Brenner from Zurich, uh, it's a completely different game. So I would really recommend to start early on work together with the ENT and ought to participate in ENT endoscopic surgeries. Yeah, well, I, I would say- yeah, I that last agree. piece, and that I, last piece. Go, ahead. go ahead, Paul, you go ahead. No, say so that last piece of advice is, is fantastic. I mean, that's how we learned how to do it was working with ENT. 
Um, but yeah. I've, I've been very impressed with how the next generation has been learning this. You know, there are questions on the American boards now about the Vidian nerve. Nobody even knew what the Vidian nerve was 15, 20 years ago. <laughs> now it's on the boards. Um, so I find that studying anatomy, so people learn this anatomy from different uh, directions and comfort with endoscopy. Um, I find that residents are coming in with at least some concept of which end of the endoscope to hold and how to use it. So any chance you get to use the endoscope and get familiar with it, um, I was fortunate to learn endoscopy and microscopy at the same time. So my skills were a little bit blended, which kept me a little bit away from as much of a bias of, or comfort with one or the other. So I think there is an ability to practice, you know, just like you practice microsurgical technique, to practice endoscopic surgical technique at the same time. Um, those are the only ways I can think of, but I've been very impressed with how um, the most recent generation has been coming up with knowledge and skill sets that we just didn't have and didn't see before. And so I, I'm very curious to see what the next generation does with all of that. Yeah, yeah I, would, Good. <clears throat> I would say that the, um, the collaboration with, with Otolaryngology and T has been fantastic. And obviously that worked well at UPMC, works well at many places. I was fortunate to work with both the men and, and with Rick Corral. And now I work with Chester Griffiths, who's fantastic. And um, it makes, it just makes a huge difference as Nikolai said. And um, also makes your day easier too, because um, you know, they start, they start the case. Uh, we love that about it too. And the fellows, you know, our fellows get a full, essentially a full rhinology fellowship because they're there from the beginning. And um, so I think it's excellent for the, for fellowship training too. Don't you reckon it's funny how some of us make these dogmatic statements about how, you know, tuberculin meningiomas, cell meningiomas have to be done through this approach or that approach. And I don't know, I've been really, uh, perplexed. You know, Ted Schwartz is obviously a great surgeon and, you know, a thoughtful sort of guy. Well, you know, he says all tubercular meningiomas have to be done from below. I say they all have to be done from above. It's kind of weird that, you know, people who are experienced and uh, good surgeons, good reporters, you know, come up with completely different uh, dogma uh, about the same pathology. Dan, I noticed that you didn't even mention the cortical cuff in your talk. Do you think it's not important or? I mean, it's, no, I, I don't, you know, look, if there's a vessel attached to the tumor engulfed by the tumor, you, it's just, you have to be aware of that. I think, Paul, you mentioned that in your, in your talk. Um, it just changes, changes what you might be able to accomplish. I mean, oftentimes when it looks like they're engulfed, they're really not engulfed. They're just kind of stuck and you can, you can get them off. But um, uh, it doesn't it doesn't really change our approach. I think the the paracellar anatomy is much more important. The degree of optic canal invasion, how wide the tumor is, how deep the cell is. Those th those things to me make more difference as to what we're going to be able to accomplish. And um, but you know our trend has shifted. We're doing more from below. Then from above, when we published that paper way back in 2008, it was it, the ratio was flipped. But you know, we weren't using nasal septal flaps; we were doing it endoscope assisted. It was right now. It seems kind of primitive, frankly. And um, we've come a long ways, you know, thanks to people like you all and Paul and Nikolai. You know, we've we've the whole field has advanced so much, and I think we're much more comfortable doing this bilateral optic canal decompression from below in, you know, massaging the carotids and, you know, dealing with the ophthalmics. It's just a different, we, we've kind of graduated into these, these different approaches now, but, you know, we've all learned hard lessons, I would say, along the way, that's for sure. Okay, so there were some questions. A lot of the questions were around dealing with CSF leak. Uh, Paul's statement about not using sealant, uh, I think it's a pretty uh, important statement. And so Paul, I'd just like you to address the, the whole concept of sealants because uh, you, know, you mentioned cost and you mentioned the fact that you know, evidence base says that you don't need it, but I don't know, it just makes a lot of sense to me. I don't think it's that expensive. And uh, I, I like the fact that it's sort of, you know, the belt and brace 
uh, philosophy, I guess. I, I, I think you just summed it up. So you said, it seems, it feels good to me. I like it. Um, so we, we were using it um, in our institution and it turned out we ended up being the only ones using it after a while because people quit using it for open approaches. So I thought the best way to really answer that, I gave the same answers. Why do you use it? Well, I think it makes a difference. It forms a crust in the nose. I, you know, it feels good. I think I, you, it feels great. I'm putting glue on it. I'm putting something there that's got to seal it. So we did, and this uh, hopefully will be published. It sits on my desk. I'm the hold up for it. But we looked at 150 cases with sealant and 150 cases without sealant um, and looked at them uh, over time. Uh, exact same makeup of kinds of tumors, all intradural tumors, all 150, and found no difference in CSF leak rate. So it's very hard for me to justify even a two to five hundred dollar cost for something that makes no difference whatsoever. I might as well squirt it on the floor. Wow, wow, that's interesting. That's so good. It's very hard for me to that's good. That, my own data on that. Yeah, that's good science. <clears throat> you know. Uh, and there was equipoise in the two groups. I mean, there was absolute no difference in the size of the tumor, the BMI of the patients. You looked at that, I presume? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. The, on, um, Paul, one thing you and I have a slight difference on is this issue of lumbar drainage. You know, we published this paper a couple of years ago on our CSF lead grading system. It's 500 plus cases. And we, we use the lumbar drain in four cases. And, um, you know, I think we had nine leaks. Um, and we actually found in that small number of cases, we had a high rate of meningitis in the ones we use the lumbar drain in. And so, and we only use, this was for the full spectrum, you know, so it was, it was adenomas, rapkes, cranios, cordomas, every, meningiomas, everything. And um, we couldn't find any use. We haven't used a lumbar drain for eight years or so. We put, um, we put people on Diamox if they have a sizable leak. Um, and we, you know, if we use a nasal septal flap and a fat graft, we often will put a um, Miracil tampon in. And I think those have really helped us a lot. How many of those cases were, were high grade leaks? Um, a lot of the grade three leaks, um, so I'll tell you. The um, reason so every, every time I present that study, um, a very experienced surgeon presents their own series and the reasons they don't use lumbar drains. But the answer I have to that is that I believe in evidence-based medicine. And the truth is that a single surgeon case series is level three or four evidence. This yeah, is, yeah. No, this I hear is you. level one evidence. It's randomized. It's not subjected to my intraoperative decision-making. It is prospective. There is no stronger data than that. And these are, this is, it does not hold true now, if you look at that study for supracellar defects, and so what I've found, if you look at, for example, Marvin Bergsnyder, Jim Evans, yourself, you have, you have these large studies that show that a lumbar drain is not necessary, but almost all of those are supracellar high flow defects. And the reason is I think that that in our own series did not show a statistical difference for that group. So for craniopharyngiomas, smaller tuberculum, even medium-sized plain meningiomas, it did not make a difference. And I think the reason is that's the sweet spot for the nasal septal flap. It covers it widely, it covers it perfectly. Whereas when you start shifting anterior where you have a large defect or posterior fossa where you have, we have much higher flow, I think it's a different ball game. So I, I think that those results are not, um, are not uh, inconsistent with each other. So I think if you look at it, it's, it is, it's these large you know, olfactory group or large clival defects where it makes a big difference. And for the supracellar defects, it does not make the same difference. There's a very gentle trend there, but it's not nearly the same. Yeah, well, and you probably have bigger intracranial defects than we do, because you guys do a lot more of these to these big anterocranial fossa meningiomas probably than we do. But anyway, the thing, the thing that I learned from that is that I don't need a lumbar drain for a craniopharyngioma. So I yeah. do need these others, but for craniopharyngioma or a small tuberculum, for example, I don't need it. And that exactly fits with your data. That's, that's what true. I think that's consistent across the board. Yeah, that's true. So I think it, it, like any study, you have to look at it, at it uh, what's the population, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. 
Nikolai, do you have a view that you'd like to mention? You have to unmute. Nikolai, you need to unmute your, uh, unmute your Zoom. Just saying, uh, I think it was very nicely summed up by Paul. It, I think you have to look very closely in the, um, in the specific indication. And um, I absolutely agree. The super cellar area is that one which is best covered um, from transnasally. And this is not the, the cases with, with the biggest problems. Yeah. Okay, well, I've looked at some of the other questions and they're mostly comments. Uh, oh, we've got a lot of compliments, that's nice. <laughs> we can read out all the compliments if you like. Oh, Dr. T is a great surgeon. Dr. T is a great presenter. Uh, <laughs> I have a different one here. <laughs> Charlie, you forgot to brush your hair though, Charlie. I know we got you up in the middle yeah. of the night, but you forgot to brush your hair. Oh, very funny. All of you got hair, haven't you? If all of you got hair now, but all of you got receding hairlines, so you're going to be at my stage in a few years. <laughs> We're working on it. God, it's funny. Okay, Linda, well, listen, I think we can wrap it up, you know, unless you've got some comments. I'd like to thank all the speakers. Uh, it's been very enjoyable. I still learn every time I hear you speak. I uh, want to thank Seattle Science Foundation. They've been incredibly professional in their... Uh, uh, in their organization of this conference. Uh, I want to thank uh, Linda in particular, who's been uh, on top of all of us to make sure that we get our talks in, in time and to get CME credits for all you guys. Uh, and uh, finally, I'd like to wish you the very best. You know, we are very lucky in Australia. We haven't had to have lockdown or uh, social distancing for some time now. We've only had less than a thousand deaths and uh, you know, life is basically back to normal and has been almost normal now for several months. Whereas I know a lot of you are still suffering. So my thoughts go out to you. Uh, 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 stay strong, uh, stay positive, uh, keep up the camaraderie. Let's have more of these Zoom meetings so that we can stay in touch. And we all look forward to the day that we can travel again. So to my faculty, thank you very much. Uh, to the attend attendees, thank you for listening. And to Linda, thank you for organizing it. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Charlie, great Thank program. you, Charlie. Thank you, everybody. Thank you,